Hello, everybody. This is Stu Smith, and this is a new edition of Two Through and After. And we got a special guest today, Bert Kuntz, who is a former Army Special Forces combat medic. And uh, today we're going to hear his story. So whatever that story is from, you know, what inspired you to join the military to your military life and then what you're doing now afterwards. So I think everybody's um, excited to hear about your story, especially to and through, but I'm really excited to hear about what you are doing now because I've seen you all over the place. And, you know, if there's a, a poster child for, you know, how to transition out of the military into doing something that you love, I, I think you are that guy, you know, so but let's, before we get to all that, let, let me just ask you, but my simple first question is, Bert, you know, who were you before you joined the military? Stu, first, thanks. Thanks for having me on your uh, program here. This is great. Uh, before I start, I just want to, my background with you real quick. So I came in, uh, well, we'll get into that. I, I originally, before I joined the military, I, I was fourth generation military in my family. Nobody had joined. I'm the youngest of four siblings. Uh, so for me, I always, I always had thought about joining the military, but it's one of those things that I didn't do. And I was, uh, I got really into do climbing, skiing, hiking, specifically whitewater kayaking. So before the events to 9-11, I worked at a it worked in South Africa for a while, living down there, working at, at an adventure company, doing kayaking and, and stuff like that. And then also worked on a game ranch down there. And then right, right when 9-11 happened, I was actually working for a outdoor shop, which isn't there anymore, but it was uh, a shop in, in Boulder, Colorado, climbing an outdoor shop. So that was kind of my life before, before uh, joining the military. And then 9-11 uh, happened and that, that kind of, for me, was trigger to you know, take take up those thoughts in my head. I'd always wanted to join. My dad was in the, the Navy. My grandfather was in the Army. Um, that was the perfect opportunity for me. So I was a, a post-9-11, 18 X-ray. For those of you guys that don't know what the 18 X-ray program is, you come in right off the street. It's It, it was called the Rep 63 program back mm -hmm. in the Vietnam era where guys could go from the National Guard or from elsewhere could go into Army Special Forces and they were having a recruiting problem when special forces was ramping up in Vietnam and they were just you know, kind of going around and asking people to join and they weren't getting the numbers they wanted. So they had this rep 63 program. Well, that kind of got reactivated as the guards always used it. The national yeah. guards, which is the two groups have always used it, but that push got moved over to the civilian side and the regular army of pulling guys off the street, sending them to, uh, Army infantry basic training down at Fort Benning, and then you go straight across the street to Airborne School. If you continue to make it through that, then you go to Fort Bragg. You do some training there and some assessment stuff and a train up to see if you're ready to go to actual SFAS. And then when the cadre there, which are all Special Forces guys, deem that you're ready to go, they give you a slot for selection. You go to selection, and uh, the rest is history. You either make it or you don't. So that path for me, I had, I had uh, a wilderness EMT basic before I joined the military that I got through Knowles and outdoor leadership school. Oh, that's awesome. Great uh, course. Great uh, course. Phenom phenomenal oh, course. One of the only places in the world where you can get your, your EMT and then get into wilderness attachment in, in 28 days. And, and the, wow. for those watching this, the G I don't work for Knowles, no affiliation with Knowles, right. but the GI bill does cover that and it's covered under, the twenty thousand dollars a year you get for schools that are non-college schools. So That's if you awesome. want to get an EMT, go go look at Knowles. The GI Bill will pay for it. Everything your room and board, your course, your books, all of it. It's only about four grand, but they'll pay for all of it. Anyway, um, awesome. So for me, the choice was clear. I always wanted to be an eighteen Delta, but I wasn't a very good student in high school. Not not because of my ability to learn, but my ability just to focus. I wasn't a good student in high school. Could it could, well, let's say I could have been a better student. So for me, the 18 Delta course, you, you got to pass that on the ASVAB. You got to have the scores you need. Um, I got those, was able to request 18 Delta and I got 18 Delta. So I was able to go to the 18 Delta course and, and made it through that as a first time go. Uh, and, you know, while I'm talking about it, I always get asked, what's the hardest part about being in the military for you? What was the most difficult thing? Again, for me, it was the 18 Delta course. It is, yeah, it is, 
it is 11 to 13 months geared on how the course is, but it is drinking from the fire hose 24 hours a day. You end up doing, I think when we went through, you had 92 hands-on exams in that 13 months or something like that. And then a bunch, a bunch of written exams and it is, it's no joke, but uh, go ahead. I tell you what, man, that 18 Delta course, everybody I know who is an 18 Delta is an incredible combat medic and just, or just they just do incredible things. I mean, I, they're so knowledgeable and, you know, I can, I can see that in, uh, you know, I can see their, their preparation, you know, going through that course and graduating that course and it just, their abilities are just phenomenal. I mean, I yeah, like I said, every every eighteen Delta I talk to is I I think a near genius with the human body. Yeah, it is hands down, um, and it it is hands down the best medic course that I've ever seen. I've taken a lot of civilian courses and some military courses as well, like OEMS, which I don't know is out there anymore. Again, let me also caveat our interview here with I've been out of people. I'm still connected to a lot of people in the military, but I've been out for almost eight years now. So yeah. that, that gets lost in the sauce a little bit with our, so with my social media or doing the TV show on history and stuff like that. I've been out for, for eight years. So my, my attention nowadays is focused on the guys that I do business with, which we'll get into. And yeah. then the other is the guys that are out there now. And, and you're, I think you're in the same boat. You're, 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 uh, you've been out for a little while. Yeah. And, and your focus is on fitness and, and personal health and, and business, and you still have a strong connection to the Navy. But I always caveat that now that I've been out for eight years because, you know, I've been talking to some of the guys like Matt Best and Evan Hafer and the guys that I do work with here now that own companies and are, are veterans as well. Eight years is a long time. And, yeah. and I look back on it now and it's like, man, I've been out for, I've been out for eight years. You know, and that's almost as long as I was in. I was in for 10. Right. So I'm, I'm hitting that threshold, but uh, the 18 Delta course, even have been out, even having been out that long, I still am confident off of that 18 Delta course, and I think I will be my entire life at least doing a marginal to good job on any kind of trauma or trauma management scenario. That's how good that course is. It is yeah. hands down one of the best courses in the world for, for uh, trauma medicine. And I think it always will be. It's again, it's changed a lot since I went through there, but the guys, the 40 guys that I went through that my course class with um, several of them aren't here anymore. You know, God bless them. Rest in peace. Uh, Really good guys that, that paid the ultimate sacrifice, but of the guys that stayed in the army, a lot of those guys are still in the community, still doing phenomenal stuff or work back at the schoolhouse and then it's remarkable the amount of guys in my 18 Delta class out of 40 dudes that are now either PAs and even more remarkable that are doctors yep. and surgeons, and they still do their guard time. The two guys that sat on the left and right of me and, and that I spent every weekend with are both physicians. And, yeah. and uh, that, I think that's par for the course. The more I meet 18 Deltas that are, you know, have been out for a while, it's, it, it astonishes me. And I don't know why, but it does. But, you know, the amount of them that are at actual physicians or surgeons now, which is just awesome. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I would definitely say it is a hell of a preparation course for any medical school that you, you want to formalize later on in your life. You know, that, that's a great after story as well. You know, if, if that's something that you, you would want to do, you know, one day, you know, as, with those 18 Delta credentials. Well, it um, is, and in, in the, the area of special operations command has done a good job of, and specifically use of SOC within that med theater is, is getting guys credentialed from your background, my background. They're starting to help guys because, you know, this conversation you, when we, we talked about it, was talking about that transition out of the military. Yeah. And I think people in the special operations community are really starting to take hold of how do we get these guys the most credits for college and the most experience and set them up properly so that they can take what they've learned in special operations and transition using those skills, whether it's in business, medicine, yep. communications, weapons, whatever it is, you're starting to see a shift of guys actually taking those tangible skills they learned in special operations and applying those to the business world. 
Absolutely. And, and, you know, it's, if, if you just get a little creative with it and just have a little bit of that self-confidence that got you through the training in the first place, it, it can be a phenomenal transition for people. It really can. It, 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 it doesn't go without saying though that we are a pretty rough community on each other. So yes, you get out and you start doing business. I'm sure you've probably seen it. I've I've been in that situation. I've been the problem in that situation. But you get a type personality guys that get out and start doing business after the military, and you're going to butt heads with people, and you're going to disagree with people whether you work for them, they yeah. work for you, or you partner with stuff. But I can't stress enough: find the right kind of guys that you would want to go to combat with. Yeah. And go into business with them after you've left the military. Guys that yeah. you trust with your family, with your, your money, with your time. Find some of those guys and gravitate towards each other for, for the right reasons. And, yeah, that, and that's I, great advice. Yeah. It's, it is tough because you get out of the military and you go through this down. I went through it. I think everybody goes through it, especially from community. You go through the transition where you, 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 you go from being really great and super special and you walk into a chow hall in Iraq and everybody goes, Oh, there's the special guys. Nobody uh, cares about you when you walk into a chow hall or a restaurant out in the civilian world. So you <laughs> yes. got to start to, I yeah. won't say you got to forget about your past life, but you have to, you can't look at it under a microscope and try and maintain that for your post-military career. You have to reinvent yourself if you will. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and know, for me, I've gone, you know, I've gone through several different transitions uh, in the business world, whether it's working for people that it just didn't work out right. or business partnerships that, again, just didn't work out. But now, you know, at the or point you just you, move on, you know, you just I move do. on and do your own thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. And that's, you know, that's I think that's another part of it is, you know, the community we come from, we're all self starters and we're all motivated for the most part. Uh, to do good in the world and 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 to work 24 hours a day and yeah. I have to tell that to people when they ask what's the best thing you learned about how, what what is the best skill you took from being in the military to the business world it has nothing to do with special forces or anything I did or even 18 Delta it has to do with being in the army and being on call and working 24 hours a day yeah that now gets applied to all the guys I'm seeing that are successful with businesses post military in the civilian world are guys that have no problem working 24 hours a day and giving the same effort they did in the military to their business. And I, I don't care if you're selling t-shirts, coffee, guns, workout programs, whatever widget it is you're selling, unless you make it a 24 hour a day job, you're probably going to get beat out by somebody now. And it might be somebody who's a veteran because veterans are geared. Yeah. to work 24 hours a day. Good veterans. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I I can't tell you how many times I've pulled all nighters to get a project done and you know whether it was in the military or post military. I mean, you get on a roll, you just get it or you have a deadline and you get it done. I mean, that's there's yeah. there's no gray area. No, know? and that's the difference. The guys that would go into isolation and plan you know, that's the guys I'm working with now is the guys that are like, Hey, we've got, we got mission planning. We're in isolation for a week. It's not the guy that goes back to his rung or back to his bunk and, and crashes or the guy that's like, Hey, I need to get chow six times a day. Hmm. You surround yourself with the guys that had no problem digging in and, and eating a peanut butter or jelly sandwich in isolation and planning. Right. And you know, that's kind of, you know, where I'm at now and where, where peacemaker is in this group that I've surrounded myself with is phenomenal, phenomenal guys. Yeah. So let me just kind of start back a little bit. So you got out of the military and I think the first time I ever heard about you was through the go Ruck program. Absolutely. So, so is that one, is that one of your first jobs out of the military doing go Ruck stuff? Oddly enough, my first job out of the military was uh, working as a, a vet tech and a zookeeper at the Fort Worth zoo. And uh -huh. My wife worked at TCU, which is about half a mile away from the Fort Worth Zoo. And I always had a love for animals. And then at 18 Delta, I went and applied for a job there as a, as a zookeeper with no zookeeper experience and thought, ah, I might as well try it to zoo. I like animals. It's a chance to, to not work with people so much and work with animals. And, and I needed that. Yeah, you know, I, I, I agree. Was military, I, was, I was a little burned out and down on myself and just, you know, transitioning into the civilian life of going from where I was at in a SIF company 
and deploy and deploy and doing J set after J set training mission, combat rotation, J set to get out of the military and slam on the brakes and, and just try and be an ev- average everyday civilian is it's not fun. Mm, uh, yeah, yeah. But my first job was at the zoo and, and a buddy of mine, Garrett, uh, Garrett, who I worked with um, Garrett, I think Garrett's still in the national guard, so I won't say his last name, but um, he had called me and he was working at GORUCK. He was one of the first guys they had there at GORUCK and, mm. and uh, brought me on there. And it turned out to be a phenomenal, phenomenal job. I had my ups and downs with, you know, it's again, you get 80 guys working for a company that are all special operations vets. Everybody has their own persona. They go out and do these events. Yeah. But overall, the, the, you know, Jason McCarthy, who started GORUCK, has started a phenomenal company that is going to be infinitely successful in the community. Again, it's a community of 20 to 100,000 people at any given time. It has its ups and downs, but sure. all in all, just a phenomenal company that's out there pushing people to be better. And that's, yeah. that's and he, he hires a lot of vets you know, that are getting out. You know? Absolutely. And I think Jason, I'd, I'd have to go out on a limb and say outside of contracting companies, I don't think there's more too many companies in America that have hired more veterans than than Jason and the, and the go Rup team. Like it is, my guess is right now they probably have anywhere from a hundred to 200 guys that are on staff working every weekend for them that are all combat and, and uh, special operations vets. So that's nice. That was, but that's the perfect example. I was working for go Ruck and, and go Ruck was paying me well and it was a great company to work for, but at some point, you put a certain amount of time and energy and effort into somebody else's company. And I think everybody in America that works hard as for somebody else at some point goes, I can do this myself. (laughs) When is it time for me to start my own company and put this much effort into something that I control and that my creative side and my, my ideals and my lifestyle and my cultural beliefs play into the exact product that I'm giving to a consumer and, and that was it for me. Yeah. Uh, and after three years, I left go Ruck and started another company that was doing medical stuff and it just didn't work out. Not here nor there. It was just two different partnerships, two different owner groups. And we didn't get along that well on business. And it was, right. it was, it, it just, it, and that's one of those things, Evan Hafer, who's the CEO and founder of black rifle. And I were just talking about that this morning. And it was, uh, you know, sometimes relationships just don't work out. Right. And it's not a big deal and, and, and it can get ugly. And if you can try and avoid that and look at everything black and white on a business level and that, that uh, leaving that med company ended up being the best thing that I've ever done. And not, not for negative reasons, just sure. it pushed me to get a job on the ranch that I was working on that, that ultimately led to starting Peacemaker uh, and, and the rest is history. Yeah, I saw you. I mean, you created a great social media platform. Um, you know, I guess maybe part of it was maybe part, you know, while you were doing Go Ruck, you got a big following oh, know, yeah, from, from, from that world. And then yeah. you just kind of parlayed that into, you know, your next venture, which, you know, that's that's great. I mean, I, I, that's a great thing to do. And now – you know, I, I see you, you know, riding horses and doing the cowboy thing. I'm like, man, he's a cowboy. That looks pretty cool. <laughs> you that's, know, that, a, that's a neat I, transition. I grew up, I have no, I have no ranching background or horse background or, or cow background. Um, I just, again, got to one of those stages. It was a Tuesday afternoon and I knew the sheriff, a deputy sheriff of Tarrant County, which Fort Worth sits in Tarrant County, who I oddly enough met again through the go Rup community. He came out and did a couple events uh, a couple of my events in Fort Worth and, and, uh, we hit it off and, um, Mike McDaniels, his name, he's still, he's still, uh, plugging away. He's on the livestock enforcement division of Fort Worth. Fort Worth still has guys that go out. The cow gets on the highway or, you know, a herd of cows gets out or a horse gets out. They still go out and round them up and, and, and put them in a, a detainment and people got to come bail their cows out. So <laughs> I call awesome. Mike and- yeah, I called him and said, "Hey, do you know uh, do you know anybody around here? I've always wanted to work. The two things I always wanted to do was, you know, be a special operations guy, or uh, or or be a cowboy." And that's awesome. They go, you know, they shift, <laughs> but I'd already already done the military thing and special operations. So the next, you know, it was like, "Hey, I'm in Texas. 
my wife's got a good job here. If there's ever a chance that I could go work on a ranch and start, I, I, I volunteered to work for nothing, but I met Buster Frierson who owns, uh, he doesn't own any, he, he uh, runs a ranch right outside of Fort Worth and Buster, people see him in our peacemaker stuff. Buster is stuck in the, the 1850s. You know, when you meet him, he's awesome. built like a Dallas Cowboys linebacker and he's, he, he hits the gym twice a day and he still manages to run a ranch 24 hours a day. And he's one of the best ranch rodeo cowboys in America. And I just got lucky and got it, went out there, worked for him for 10 bucks an hour, thinking I was going to be a cowboy. And, and let me tell you, Stu, the first six months of working there, first four to six months, I didn't get on a horse at all. It was fixing fences in 97 degrees and 80% humidity in North Texas. Yeah. It was fixing fences, digging post holes, you know, mowing giant pastures and, and doing anything and everything that needed to be done that so that that right there that one bit of humility for me of taking a huge pay decrease and shifting gears in my life to go work on a ranch for 10 bucks an hour changed my life forever more so than even the military did and i know oh. that's a, i know it's a pretty bold statement uh but more so than than anything i've ever done in my life working for $10 an hour on a ranch for a guy just doing honest, hard work from five o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock at night for a year nice. changed, changed my life forever. And that kind of led into Peacemaker, uh, where we're, where we're at now with Peacemaker and Buster's actually an owner of uh, Peacemaker trading now as well. So oh, that's awesome. Return the favor there and get him involved in what I'm doing. So, uh, so really where'd really you get the idea for Peacemaker? I've always been fascinated with the 1800s, uh, the good parts of the 1800s. I know, you know, we get, I get, I get mail every now and then about Peacemaker and why would I want to revert back to a time when there was this, that, and the other thing politically going on in America, or there was, you know, some human rights. It's, that part of the America is a phenomenal, if not one of the best times of American prosperity and growth. And, you know, the railway, railways out West, the, the farming and ranching techniques that came out of that period that now sustain our, our agricultural uh, and, and our food in America. I've always been fascinated by that, by the ranchers, the cowboys, westward expansion, frontiersmen, people that just literally packed up their stuff on the East Coast and said, we're heading out West and, and we're not doing it in a Ford F-350, we're doing it in a covered wagon. Right. When you really start to peel back on the onion on how great that period was and how great those people that said, you know what, there's a better life for us than being in a crowded city with disease and chaos and hustle and bustle. It's, it's, it's one of my most favorite times in America. And that was kind of the basis of Peacemaker was to take all the good stuff out of the building of this country, west of the Mississippi, and put it into a lifestyle and apparel brand because that's what I wear anyway. You know, I'm a jeans, I'm a jeans, boots, t-shirts and hats guy I always have been. It was like, man, if I'm already buying this stuff, let's take a chance on it and see if we can make some of this stuff and sell it. And, and again, with the following from go ruck and, you know, plugging away on social media and the TV show for history channel, all of those kind of bumped peacemaker and got us out there. And now it's now it's kind of growing like a weed on its own. That's awesome. So That's awesome. we've, been, we've been super, super lucky and super fortunate. Our customer base that we've had since day one is phenomenal and they've stuck with us through thick and thin and they've kind of pushed this company. So I don't ever, I, I, I hardly ever say I'm an owner, a peacemaker. I don't ever want to be called the CEO of peacemaker. If anybody will be, it'll be Candace, but man, I'm having a blast with it. It's like you with your fitness stuff and the guys that we've teamed up with here, you know, there's some other owners on board. Matt Best, who's an owner in Black Rifle and an owner in uh, an owner and CEO of Article 15, is an owner of Peacemaker. Buster, who I work with on the ranch, is an owner of Peacemaker. My wife is an owner of Peacemaker. There's two other veterans that are owners of Peacemaker that I, I won't disclose their names at this time, but we form this group of people that are, you know, that have like-minded, you know, like-minded ideals and again, just love to work hard and have fun. Yeah. And that's the key to this thing. And I'm not just seeing it with Peacemaker and the group that we've formed. I see a dozen companies on the internet and social media every day that are SEALs, PJs, Rangers, 
yeah. Marsoc guys or recon guys or, or Army SF guys that are all starting to work with each other. And again, you watch the ones that get it right and are having fun doing it. And, it, and there is nothing more, more, more rewarding post-military than seeing other veterans team up with civilians and, and, and making awesome products. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'm a big fan of everybody that you named there, you know, in, in your, in your group of, of veterans, uh, you know, especially those guys that came up with that damn movie, uh, you know, range 15. Yeah. They're great. Uh, Nick, Nick so I mean, damn all, funny. All these guys, all these guys involved. And when you meet them again, n n nobody in our veteran space is without their ups and downs, but when you meet these guys, these guys, all the people that I just named, they will take the time. And, and Evan Hafer is the perfect example of, of, of the quintessential great American business person, not just his military career, but when I first met him a year and a, just a year and a half ago, he said something to me that I'll never forget. And at, at first I was like, this guy's full of shit. Excuse the language. Mm -hmm. But he said, uh, I don't want a hundred million dollars. Like I can, I can get a hundred million dollars with what I'm doing and where I'm going. I would rather surround myself with a hundred veterans and make them all millionaires. And he's literally doing it. Yeah. Him, Matt, Beck, Jared Taylor, these guys here in this building at black rifle and what they do with the companies they're helping and the companies their ownership in, they are literally taking veterans like myself, mentoring us, helping us through business and there is no doubt in my mind that Evan is going to have a hundred veterans that he's helped become millionaires. And, yeah. and that right there, man, we can talk all we want about cool guy stuff and missions and shooting yeah. people in the face and what awards you've gotten and how many deployments you've been on. But at the end of the day, it's just how you treat each other as human beings and, and, and helping your brothers and sisters from the military. And this group personifies that too. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better group of guys. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I watch your social media and, and all the guys that you're taking pictures with and hanging out with. And I'm like, ah, that is so awesome. Well, you know? Dude, my background with you is a funny one. Um, he's still in, I think he's, a, he's still in with, uh, I won't mention his last name, but a guy named Phil that I was in the 18 Delta course with, he was a flight navigator for the, for the uh, Navy. He decommissioned to join as an 18 x-ray and came in, I think at 36 years old and Phil was in better shape than anybody in our class, just a stud. Well, he came to class one day with this book and everybody was busting his balls about it. Cause he came <laughs> in and he was like, we got to try these workouts. And it was the Stu Smith Navy seal workout. And I think it was your original book. Okay. So mind, you, got it. mind you, we're a bunch of guys, in the first quarter of the, the special forces qualification course in the first few months of the 18 Delta course with cadre and sharks everywhere. And he comes in with this Stu Smith Navy seal workout book. That's and, funny. And it was your simple workouts. It was all, it was all calisthenics. Calisthenics. And you had your pull up pyramid on there where you did one pull up rest, two pull ups rest up to 10 back down. And that thing killed us for a few months. But by the end of the 18 Delta course, we were hammering that thing and we were just laughing about it this morning here at this building. That's the best shape I think I've ever been in in my entire life. Ah, well, thank you. And all we were doing was running, <laughs> running, swimming, doing push ups, pull ups, sit ups, and running sprints and running and, and uh, doing swims in the pool there at Fort Bragg on our den. So oh, that's awesome. But that's the perfect, again, that's the perfect, we beat each other up a lot whether you're a SEAL, whether you're an SF guy, whether you're sure. a ring or recon, MARSOC is, is, MARSOC is blowing up and is going to be a huge entity yeah. of the military and they're doing FID and everything else that everybody else has is, is, is been doing. Um, and we're, we're pretty good at beating each other up, but stuff like that, I laugh about it. I, I, every time I think about getting that book, when somebody says Navy SEAL joke this or an SF joke that or SF guys are fat or Navy SEALs are this, I always think for some reason, I always think back to the Q course, and the 18 Delta course of using your original Stu Smith's Navy SEAL workout book to get in the best shape I've ever been in. So <laughs> there should be more of that in this community. Post military well, or not. They're just, there should be the lines, the walls should be taken down and we should be helping each other. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've always tried to help other people to, um, you know, move from, 
military to civilian world, whether it's they want to get into book writing or they want to start a website or whatever. And, you know, in fact, we even started a uh, DIY media marketing academy. And it's, oh, it's awesome. like do it yourself, media marketing, me and a buddy of mine. Um, and um, we teach people how to be a media company that sells X. Right. So it doesn't matter what you sell. You can't be in the T-shirt business without being a media company first. You know, exactly. I, can't, I can't sell fitness unless I'm a media company selling fitness. Well, and that's exactly it. And you mentioned, you know, as you, as you, whatever it is you do, like for me, it was Go Ruck picked up, you know, picked up a pretty good following with Go Ruck. And then I picked up a larger following with the TV show yeah. and a larger following with the stuff we're doing now with marketing. And I, you know, people ask me every day, hey, I want to start a, t I get emails every day saying, hey, I'm a vet, I'm getting out. I want to start a t-shirt and apparel company. Would you be willing to help me? I answer every one of them and I yeah. say, Hey, yeah, here's the deal though. You can't, mm -hmm. unless you got a million dollars to spend on sponsored ads, you can't just, it doesn't just happen overnight. Yeah. We started, you know, we were working out of our garage with peacemaker. Yep. Evan Hafer started roasting coffee in his garage with black rifle coffee, Matt best and Jerry Taylor and, and Rocco. Those guys started doing t-shirts out of a garage as well when they started article 15 i think nick palmashano same way yep, yep. and my peacemaker is not even close to being as big as any of those companies are right now but that model of you know grinding but those guys also push the content and i keep telling guys that hey yep. you want to start a company i don't care what what expertise you're selling whether it's shooting or what widget you're selling you have to put yourself out there and you have yeah. to get a media following. You have to have a social media following or it's just not going to work unless yeah. you have a million dollars to anonymously start a brand and just push it on sponsored ads. Yeah. You have to put yourself out there. And, and yeah. subsequently I think that's what, that's what civilians want, you know, more than ever with go rucks or your fitness programs or coffee or t-shirts, People want to have that connection. People that didn't serve want to have that connection. Sure. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're viable programs, uh, but also they're cool things. I mean, you get some cool shirts and cool hats from these veteran owned uh, apparel businesses, you know, and who, what guy doesn't want to be a cowboy, you know, it, that's it. And you hit, you, know? the nail, like, you hit the nail on the head for me. It was, I had this, this vision in my head, and I think a lot of guys do when they get out specifically special operations of taking those skills, but there is a way of pigeonholing yourself. So yeah. the two greatest words that I ever, ever heard post-military about starting a business were shared value. Yeah. And it's, so you look at one of our most successful t-shirts that we've ever made is a dog team. And I have Australian shepherds. So I could have made an Australian shepherd t-shirt and hit, you know, made a connection with, at, at its most, made a connection with 2.2 million Americans that own Australian Shepherds. Or I can make a dog t-shirt and connect with 86.7 million Americans that own dogs. Absolutely. And I try and explain that to guys. It's like, hey, you want to yep. do a tactical company and shooting and this and that. That's awesome. But don't just go after the fanboys and the cool guys and the guys that have a million dollars with the guns. Yep. Go after anybody and everybody that would own a gun and figure out a way to get them involved in your company. Yeah. And it's yeah. not just guns and t-shirts and it doesn't matter what it is. You know, if you, whatever widget you make, that shared value, the more shared value you have with more people. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's diversifying is what you're yeah. doing. You're just diversifying your, your market and you know gr making it grow because you do the same thing i mean I, I did the exact same thing with fitness workouts you know i wrote a program for you know the navy side of the house and then you know after training a bunch of people for army and air force and marines you yep. know i wrote You're books for the for the army pft the ranger pft the marine corps pft you know it just just created you know, standalone products for each one of those things. Instead of writing about one fitness test, I've written about 40 fitness tests. No, you know, the, next, you know, the next logical transition, you go, civilians are, as you know, because my wife is addicted, my wife is addicted to your stuff. You know, she's, <laughs> you, you actually sent us a book and signed it. And my wife still pulls that thing out every three or four months 
And that's part of her cycle is going through one of your newest books. I think it's the one you have in the background behind you. Uh, tactical fitness. Yeah. yeah yep. She, she throws that in about four times a year. She throws nice. in a month of doing your stuff. She's an and, animal. Oh, she's a beast. And she, uh, <laughs> We'll start doing that stuff at a gym and what's the next thing that happens is every female in the gym starts coming over and going, man, I, I need to do your workouts. So that branching out and there's companies doing it, you know, they're doing like soft fleets, another one that is branched yeah. out all, all military guys yeah. in their ownership, except, you know, I think they have one, they're one of their owners. It's not, not prior service. He's the brains of the bunch. Yeah. Um, just kidding. But, but soft, like Softleet's another company that's phenomenal. It's doing that. Softleet yeah. is. Yeah, I teamed trained. up with them for a product as well. Yeah. Yeah. And they've yeah. got, you know, they, yeah. every day they get more followers and they're starting to transition slowly towards pace of it. Military folks are always going to work out. How do we get the other 200 million Americans out there to see what works for the military and how we can help them be better people and get stronger and better every day too. Yeah. That's, that's what we should be doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I will say this. One thing I learned is unfit people don't buy fitness books. Just something I've learned. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. But yeah, it's it. And it's, it's great. Um, but uh, my military career is, is arguably, I, I, you know, we kind of skipped that section of my military career. I went out to first group with first special forces group phenomenal support group out there phenomenal guys out there and then i got lucky and went into the sif uh charlie won one out there and, and into the commanders and extremist force and again those guys have shaped the good guys out there and the mentors i had have shaped everything that i've done to this day and everything i will do moving forward so that's cool so, so, so tell me this tell me this so one question i like to ask people in this two through and after series is when was it that you realized somewhere in your training that you said, I got this, you know, I can do this. You know, I mean, we all kind of have a little bit of doubt before and, you know, you're like sucking it up to make it through certain selection programs. And then there's something that just clicks and says, I got this. I can do this. As long as I stay healthy, I'm good. Uh, you know, Stu, to be honest with you, I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever did. You know, the 18 Delta course the physical stuff, when I went to selection, I was 145 pounds and probably 8%, 6 to 8% body fat and could run, run forever, ruck forever. Didn't have any issues with the stuff out there, you know, the, the mind, the mind games or the, the mental stuff. For me, going to the 18 Delta course, and again, I don't, I don't know too many medics that, I don't think I've ever met another 18 Delta that said I'm really great at medicine because mm -hmm. there's always that doubt. Right. And I know a lot of 18 Deltas that are really great at medicine, like guys right. that I would be around and immediately on a mission go, everybody's going to be fine because we had that guy here and he was a medic. Right. He wasn't the best shooter. He was, a, he was the best medic. So for me, and I used to practice medicine and cross train with the guys. Uh, I don't think I ever, I don't think I ever got that. I always had this kind of awkward uncomfortableness that I was going to let people down to the left or right of me. I never got fully confident with, I got this. Okay. Because medicine, gotcha. medicine, That's fair. combat yeah. medicine. Yeah. And I, and I won't say it was, it didn't hinder my, my, my abilities, but I just always kind of, I think I sat on that line of, I know I'm not bad at this, but I'm not the best at this. Well, I think that's probably, you know, in, in hindsight of asking that question, I, I think it's probably a better frame of mind to be in as a medic, you know, just yeah. because it, there's, a, there's a humility of the human body that, yes, I can, I can, I have the ability to perform well if I need to. However, I don't know everything. And I, I think that, you know, that's, that's very healthy. More specifically with medicine than anything else, you have to, you know, I know there's like, you talk about the circle of awareness, whether you're, whether you're military free fall or doing medicine or even, even, you know, the malfunctions of a weapon. You should always, if you have that kind of uneasiness, you should always be checking that circle of awareness with whatever skill set you have in special operations is. 
medicine, guns, you name it. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm at the Black Rifle Building. I'm, I, I, I hijacked their podcast. Uh, That's all right. Their podcast That's awesome. So. But uh, does that make sense? Oh, yeah. I always absolutely really confident. But the second half of that for me is I would look to the guys to the left and right of me at any given time throughout my entire military career and go, these guys got it. Yeah, we got this. Yeah. We've got it. Yeah. These guys got it, so we got it. And, yeah. and I'll tell you, on any given day, on any team I was on, there was, the, there was guys that left me that I was probably a little better than at some things, but there was always guys to the right of me that were better shooters, that were better, better combo guys, better leaders, yeah. better, yeah. better, better planners. But it is. Of, it really is amazing the talent in any special ops group. You know, when you got a team of 10, 12, 15, 20 people, it, it is amazing the things that can be accomplished with that group. There is nothing in my life that I've seen more impressive than a really good special forces. And I can't speak for the Navy or Air Force or Marines, but there's nothing more impressive that I've seen in my entire life than a well-oiled special forces operational detachment alpha that, that works well together and whether thick or thin can get things done and put all politics and BS and drama aside and just work. There is nothing I've seen more impressive that, than that in my entire life. Yeah. And, I would just, agree. And, that, and, it, and it's amazing. Like you get a task and you're like, yeah, we can do that. You know, and it, it might seem impossible to the person who is not a part of that group. Right. Absolutely impossible. But, but that group is like, yeah, oh, yeah, we can get that done. <laughs> that's- no, and that's it. And you have the, the one of the best teams that I was on. On one side of the team, you had you had guys that, you know, for for lack of a better analogy, would probably would have been really good criminals. But yeah. they, but they joined the army and they became really really good special operations guys. On the other side of the spectrum, you have guys that probably you, you know probably would have been the best preacher, reverend, or priest in the entire world and done so much good for humanitarian causes around the world, but they joined special operations. So they've become the best special operations team leader or team sergeant that they possibly could be. And then you have everybody in between from ultra athletes to super high 12 pound brain IQs that graduated from Harvard and decided to join special operations. And I think we do too much looking at each other in a negative light and beating each other up. I think that should be the focus to journalists and media stuff of picking apart some of these teams and going, here's the dy- dynamic of a SEAL team. Here's the dynamic of a real SF team. It's not like Hollywood. Right. It's- well, that, that's, that's my mission, to be honest yeah. with you, Bert. That, this two through and after series that I'm creating is, is all about, you know, talking to the people that have been there. You know, we're, we're, at one point we're wannabes at the next phase of their life, they did it in the next phase of their life. They are moving on and doing even greater things. So that's for me, I'm in that position right now. You got guys like, again, I'm surrounded right now by guys like Matt, Matt best, Evan Hafer, Jared Taylor, Tyler gray is a, you know, I don't know if you know Tyler, but Tyler and and myself Mm -hmm. and Jack Osborne just launched another company this week. That's in the apparel and lifestyle brand called Buffalo locomotive. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. I'm at the point now where, you know, Evan, Evan Hafer has become a really, a really, really good command sergeant major for me in my, in my civilian and business career. If that, if that makes sense. Sure. Sure. He's a guy that I don't go on missions with him directly right now as a businessman, but I can go sit in the sergeant major's office and say, Hey, can you help me with this? And, and there's not a better business guy in America right now, vet or not that I've seen hands down than Evan, but the ability to transition out of the military, find guys like him and lean on him and have him help me with the mistakes he's made. Yeah. And I think any good team sergeant, any good team leader is the same way. They don't talk about how awesome they are. That for me has become a pinnacle of, of whether I sit in a conversation or I tune it out is, when a guy starts telling you that's a, a special operations guy starts telling you about all the stuff he's, he's messed up and what he learned from it, 
Yeah. That's the guy that's caught my attention. Yeah, I, I don't care. The guy that's talking about how awesome he is. Yeah. I'll, I'll drink my water and, and, and move on. But you get guys like this who have humility and just honesty and integrity. And it's like, Hey, Bert, let me help you with this because I messed that up 10 times in my business. Let me help you not mess it up in yours. Like that's what we need more of in our community. Yeah. And oh, absolutely. I, I'm a firm believer in being an expert at failing. Yes. You, you know what I mean? Cause we all do it. You know, if you've done something on your own, you know, long enough, you're going to figure out the way not to do it because you've done it. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And that humility of meeting people that will tell you right up front, here's, here's where I've messed up. Don't do that. Yeah. That's, that's more appealing to me than here's all the awesome stuff I've done. You should do that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. They both come with each other, but you know, you have to have one, you have to have the other, but at the same time, I, I'm much more impressed nowadays by guys who are successful and they tell you the failures they made to get to yep. that point of success. Yeah. Because that's part of it. It's part of it, you know? And I mean, it's not just a, a motivational poster that you see, you know, you know, fall nine times, get up 10, you know, that's, that's how it works. Yeah. You know, that's exactly how life works. Absolutely. You know, so Bert, thank you so much for doing this, uh, two through and after, uh, series with me. Um, I think this is my one, two, three, that's my fourth show, you know, so, uh, we're, we're moving and, uh, I've been wanting to get you on here for a really long time because I see the stuff that you're doing, the people that you're, you're surrounding yourself with. And I think more people need to know that it, that kind of world after the military exists. So it absolutely exists and breaking down branch walls. Like I, I can't stress enough. The guys I talk to and want to do stuff with Marcus Capone, who was on the show with me was a, a team six. Great guy. guy. Great guy. Yeah. Phenomenal guy. But it, again, you break down the walls of branches and units and what schools you've been to and what awards you got. It, it, it's there's time for that, but there's a lot. I think time is much better spent on, helping each other out, building each other up and just focusing on working hard and, and, and surrounding yourself by people that force you to be better. And yeah. that's, you know, that's, I, if I could offer anybody advice, take some chances too. Yeah. Me walk, Love it. Me walking out on a ranch, driving up on a ranch and offering to work for free and getting paid $10 an hour was, you know, it was, it was a step back for me at the time. It ended up being the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Like hands down. So nice. the last part of the business stuff in all actuality, the real C CEO and COO of all the stuff I'm doing is my wife, Candace. She, uh, she's a beast. She's the one working 24 hours a day and she works, for, awesome. Black, she works for Black Rifle as well. But, uh, anything that, that, that we're doing right now, she's, she's, she's the rock. Nice. I love it. Find love a good it. one. Yeah. Yeah. I got one. I've been, uh, since 1990. Yes, I know so. you do. I watch all your stuff. And, <laughs> and again, I can't thank you enough for, for having me on and, yeah. and what you do for the community. And, and hopefully, uh, hopefully more people buy that book. I, I recommend it. It's the best 19 bucks that we spent through the entire Q course. Uh, well, thank you very much. Yeah. That's, I'm, I'm honored that you would say that. Um, but also, I want everybody to know that look in the description of this video because all of Bert's uh, website links, uh, his social media links will be in there. Um, it, just real quick, how can people find you that um, they just want to listen to your your website and uh, other things? Our stuff, I, I, most everything I do now is through Peacemaker Trading. So our, our social media on Facebook and Instagram is just Peacemaker Trading. I've right. got my personal stuff, Bert Koontz, but my personal stuff is turned into more pictures of my dogs than than anything else. Right. So everything else is at uh, Peacemaker Trading. Okay, awesome. PeacemakerTrading.com, Peacemaker Trading on Instagram, Peacemaker right. Trading on Facebook, and then the new company is uh, Buffalo Locomotive, and it's both on Instagram and Facebook is Buffalo Locomotive. Awesome. And then you also are working with Black Rifle Coffee. Yeah, my wife is, I don't. I, we partner with them on right. Peacemaker's Coffee. They roast all our coffees. We're going to be launching some new coffees with Peacemaker and Evan and, and Matt nice. and Dave and the team here roast all our coffee. They're the original veteran roasting coffee company. Right. And 
they roast everything right here in this building that I'm in. They've got their roasters here. They're roasting everything is roast to order for guys like us. So if there are a company out there that wants the white label coffee, get a hold of Black Rifle. Nice. There's not a group of guys out there. Um, Article 15, do stuff with those guys as well. And, and uh, JT and Matt, but uh, those, you know, Black Rifle, I can't say enough about Black Rifle. We could do an, an hour long podcast or show just about how great those guys are. And there's a lot yeah. of, there's a lot of edgy marketing with them, but behind the scenes, I won't even say veteran anymore. There's, there's no better business guys in America, in my opinion. They, they are just nice. phenomenal, phenomenal guys that want to see everybody around and be successful. Well, I, I must end with this. It must smell quite uh, divine there. You can smell it. You can <laughs> smell it. They're right off the highway, and I drive in from the mountains. You can smell it from about four blocks away pulling out the coffee roast. And, and their coffee roaster is an SF guy that, that worked for some government agencies, uh, Edwin Parnell, and he's the master roaster here. He and Evan have been doing coffee for 15 years. And, nice. And doing it longer. Um, phenomenal guys. But, yeah, you, you can smell it. You can smell it half a mile away. That's awesome. That's all. Awesome. You'll, you'll have to come out here sometime. And these guys do a bunch of podcasts. You'll, I'll have to link you up with them and come out here and do, do one of their podcasts. Absolutely. I'd love it in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat. So, Hey, Bert, once again, thank you for doing this with me. And, um, you know, I'm sure people are going to get a lot out of this and, uh, hopefully people will go check out and get one of those cool peacemaker trading shirts that you're wearing. Thank you, Stu. Appreciate it. Thanks everybody for having me on.